And I'll say, excuse me, I've got to take a photo. And I'll just tell you, name it and I'll say, you're not even for me. Yeah, it's a bit of With respect and gratitude for the original custodians of this land, the Ngunnawal and Narrambri people, we gather together today to affirm in hope and faith that we can create a sacred space of welcome for all who live in Australia. Let's gather this morning to celebrate the richness and diversity of life. John, would you like to bring us any notices that need to be brought to us? Sure. Um, so uh, next Sunday, um, Zoom. Oops. So, uh, sorry, let me get, um, un am I unmuted now? Yeah. Okay. So next Sunday, Zoom worship will be communion with Bruce Stevens and Bruce will be preaching. Worship is at 10, not 10.30 next Sunday. But don't forget, we actually moved that to daylight saving next weekend. So 10.30 daylight saving time will actually be 9.30 according to the current clock. So uh, don't be caught out by the clock change and zoom in late. The sustainability festival continues um, and next Saturday at 4 p.m. by Zoom with um, Shane Ratten, Rattenbury being asked questions by students about um, sustainability in the ACT. Um, don't forget that you can chat anytime on Zoom with friends using the uh, Zoom link that is in the church newsletter. And finally, the, um, the revelation study with Bruce Stevens continues this Wednesday at 2 p.m. And that's all, folks. Thank you, John. Uh, two very brief ones from me. A reminder from Paul that our services are recorded. If anyone has an issue with that, can you please message Paul or send him an email? And a huge welcome to Newton's, I'm sure, infinitely better half. It's wonderful to see you on the screen. Welcome to Australia and welcome to our worship. Can I ask Barbara and Robin, would you be our congregational voices for this morning? Um, that will be for the call to worship. That's, that, that's Robin Bennett and, and Barbara Burns. Um, that will be for our call to worship and there's a responsive reading. Let's join together with our call to worship. Peoples from every corner of creation Celebrate. Celebrate with all creatures on earth. Young and old across the planet. Rejoice, Rejoice in the day that God has made. Indigenous people of every land. Help us, us sense the spirit deep in each land. Black and white and brown and gray. Celebrate. Celebrate with us Hello. the colors of creation. <clears throat> All humanity on planet Earth. Praise, Praise God. God for our planet home. Sing, people, sing. Sing, sing. creation, sing. Amen. Let's pray. God of all creation, we gather grateful for the companionship of hearts and minds, all seeking to speak the truth in love. We gather grateful for our heritage, for the women and men before us, whose imagination, dedication and prophetic words and deeds made possible our dreams and our insight. And we gather grateful for the gift of life itself, mindful that to respect life means both to celebrate what life is and to insist on what it might become. May we always rejoice in life and work to cultivate a sense of its giftedness. Amen.
Well, welcome everyone. It's fantastic to see you on this, the fourth day of spring. Um, in our Protestant tradition in the Southern Hemisphere, it's Social Justice Sunday, although our Catholic friends have moved it to the end of August, which in some ways makes sense moving into spring and season of creation to have it as the week before. But we're celebrating it today. And as you probably know, we're starting a four week series of liturgies based around creation. Um, I'm roughly using the Seasons of Creation liturgy, which talks about the Greek word ekos. I know it's spelled O-I-K, but it's pronounced ekos. And it literally means the home or the hearth or in the plural, a sense of community. And from ecos in English, we get our words economy, ecology, and ecumenical. So it's a really good word to use as we enter into the season of creation. Remembering that in Psalm 24, the psalmist says, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. So every creature belongs to God and every creature is part of our earth community. And when I was thinking about what hymns we should start with, I know we had it a few weeks back, but I really couldn't go past opening with Marty Hagen's All Are Welcome. Let us build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live. Let's enjoy it and remain muted and sing along if you feel you would like to. Thank you. 
Well, there was plenty of, of, of joy and delight in that. John, would you mind bringing us our prayers of giving thanks and saying sorry? Okay, the unmute has finally worked. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the new life of spring, for the joy we feel as we move from the darkness of winter. We thank you for new friendships and old friendships renewed. We thank you for the hope that our society will change for the better and deal with the problems of climate change of family violence, of poor health and inequality. Our hopes for change are often dashed by the inadequate responses of our governments and our communities. But we are thankful for the small positive changes that do occur. Forgive us for our reluctance to contribute to change for the better. Forgive us for focusing on our own selfish preoccupations. Grant us the energy of your spirit that we may overcome our laziness and inertia to act for the common good. We thank you for the joys we experience with family and friends. We particularly thank you for the little people in our life. It is such a joy to see babies growing into young boys and girls and on to maturity. The joy they show as they experience new things inspires us to even more work to nurture their growth into new ways of being and new ways of doing. Forgive us for our impatience when our little people are slower than us at understanding things and forgive us for our jealousy when they are quicker than us. Thank you for what we learn from their innocent, trustful approach to life. Grant us the wisdom to help protect them from harm as they make their way in a world which is sometimes dangerous. Forgive us for not intervening when we should and forgive us for the opposite sin of being overprotective. Protect Finally, we are thankful for the good food we enjoy. We are thankful for everyone involved in bringing food to us, for the farmers, the food processors, the workers in shops and the cooks. May we not only be thankful in words, but may we also contribute in actions as we are able in bringing food to our tables. Forgive us for our lack of gratitude for the bountiful food we enjoy and forgive us for not giving more so that those who are hungry can be fed. We ask your forgiving spirit to transform us, to be more generous. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Picking up on one of John's comments about young people, let's take a couple of minutes to tap into our inner child, which the psychologists tell us we all have. I've always loved words, especially words which describe groupings or living habits of animals. We all know, of course, that a group of cattle is a herd and a group of crows is a murder of crows but did you know that a group of cheetahs is a coalition not sure whether that means that they only cooperate for a short time and then splinter into subgroups or not did you know that a group of ferrets is a business of ferrets which anyone who's ever seen ferrets will know is very apt as is the collective noun for giraffes, which is a tower of giraffes. But the one, the two I really like 
are porcupines. It's a prickle of porcupines, which makes a lot of sense. And I really like it, a wisdom of wombats, um, which I think is fantastic. And in the bird kingdom, a charm of finches. And any of you who've traveled in the outback and seen flocks of finches flying will know that they, they have these beautiful splashes of color. An exaltation of larks and another really apt one, a squabble of seagulls. If anyone's ever been on a seafront and thrown a chip to seagulls, a squabble is a very apt collective noun. But did you also know that in animals and birds living spaces, there is an enormous amount of what the scientists call symbiosis, that is living, living together. Ants nests support enormous numbers of other animals and insects, as do birds nests and animals nests. The living creation has learned how to cooperate so that everyone benefits. Sadly, we haven't quite got there yet. We're still on that learning curve. I hope we will learn better and better as time goes on. For our Echo Minute, two very brief snippets. One, those of you who follow the business pages will have seen that AGL, Australia's biggest emitter, had their annual general meeting this week. And 55% of shareholders supported a motion to force AGL to set short, medium and long-term decarbonisation targets, which is good news. And secondly, the man who proved that when you've got a billion dollars, what do you do? Well, of course, you send yourself into space. Jeff, Jeff Bezos, or Be Bezos, has made a $1 billion contribution to conservation projects around the world, especially targeted to biodiversity hotspots like the Congo Basin, the Andes, and the Pacific Ocean. And it will help to finance a goal to protect 30% of the world's oceans and land by the end of the decade. Hopefully that money will be, will be well used and it gives us hope. And I was touched by Bezos's reasons for giving. If you think his journey into space was a waste, this is what he said. Nature is our life support system and it's fragile. I was reminded of this in July when I went into space. I'd heard that seeing the earth from space changes one's point of view, but I was not prepared for just how much that would be true. Living down here, the, the world and the atmosphere seem vast and they seem stable. But looking back at Earth from in space, you see how the atmosphere is thin and the world is finite. Both beautiful, but both fragile. It's good that Jeff Bezos was able to have those insights. Let's continue our worship with the Brian Wren hymn. There's a spirit in the air telling Christians everywhere, praise the love that Christ revealed working in our world. Break the bread when a hungry child. 
the love that Christ revealed Living in a work and in, in a world Still the Spirit leads the fight Seeing wrong and setting right God in Christ has come to stay Live to tomorrow's life today When a stranger that harmonica at the end. Pam, would you like to bring us our readings? And the third reading, Barbara and Robin Bennett is the responsive one. Thanks, Pam. Our first reading is from Amos 5, 11 to 15 and verse 24. And I personally, when I read this, I love it. It's very modern. You levy a straw tax on the poor, and impose a tax on their grain. Therefore, though you have built stone mansions, you will not live in them. Though you have planted lush vineyards, you will not drink their wine. For I know how many are your offences and how great your sins. Seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty be with you just as you say he is. Hate evil. Love good, maintain justice in the courts. Let justice flow down like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. And the second reading from Luke's Gospel is Luke 6, verses 20 to 26. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. Well, that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. In this is the word of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Are you going to do it? Hmm? No. no, I'm not doing Can you lead us in the responsive reading, Pam, please? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> For half the world's population who have to live on less than a dollar a day, let justice flow down like a river. A river. For all those suffering from malnutrition and treatable diseases, let justice, let justice flow down like a river. For all those who experience discrimination on the grounds of gender, age, role, religion, beliefs, disability or sexuality. Let justice flow down like a river. For all those who sleep rough and those who have nowhere they can call home. Let justice, justice flow down. down like a river. For all those who've experienced physical, mental or emotional abuse, or domestic violence. Let, Let justice flow down like a river. 
For all those who are unemployed or in employment that is dehumanizing or degrading. May justice. May justice flow down like a river. For all those who are denied their basic human rights by military dictatorship or oppression. May justice, May justice flow down like a river. Justice is the currency of love in society. May Let us be instruments of justice in the world. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pam. In their social justice statement for 2021-22, titled Cry of the Earth, Cry of the Poor, the Australian Catholic bishops say this, the signs of the times are clear. We know that we human beings need a change of heart, mind and behaviour. Peace on earth must be peace for the earth as well as peace for the people of the earth. In our theme for these four weeks, we see that ekos, the Greek word for home or hearth, is the root word for ecology, ecumenical, and this week, economy, which at a global level is about planetary housekeeping. It's instructive to consider just how far modern understandings of the importance of the economy have drifted from the root meaning of creating a secure and just home for all. The Bible, both the Old and the New Testament, make clear that God will champion the cause of the oppressed and that poverty and injustice are deeply linked to, to our economic behaviour and systems. Let justice flow down like a river, righteousness like a never-ending stream. In a world of climate injustice, where careless use of fossil fuels leads to insecurity, disaster and suffering for the world's poor and marginalised, what is the good news? How can there be good news without addressing such injustice? Today's Old Testament reading is from a group of books we don't read very often, the so-called minor prophets. This one, the prophet Amos. So here's a little background on these so-called minor prophets. Amos was a shepherd from a small town in the northern kingdom of Israel, and he was called by God to speak the truth to the religious and political leaders of the day. Remember, being a prophet, regardless of how we use the word now, doesn't mean that you know the future. It does mean that you're called to speak God's truth. In modern parlance, the prophets spoke truth to power. The prophets always seemed to be ahead of the times, but that was perhaps only because, like most of us, their audience tended to be unaware of what was happening around them and not see the beginnings of a change or a threat and only noticed it when it had gathered momentum. The prophets do not predict what will happen, rather they lay out the options and the consequences of our choices. It wasn't a career path that led to popularity. It sounds like the, like the prophets would have been pretty good COVID-19 modelers. And this sort of prophet will always be a threat if we live in a, in a world of static thought patterns and belief. Because if we live in this way, our reaction to change will always be one of fear, fear of the future, fear of losing our controlling position in a society 
which leads to stoning the prophets one way or another. Witness the reaction to people calling for strong action on climate change. Al Gore, Greta Thunberg, etc. So Amos was called to speak at a time when the kingdom of Israel appeared to be doing very well. They were gathering land and wealth from neighbors, but they had forgotten who they were and what their roots were. Does this sound familiar? They had forgotten their heart. They had forgotten the heart of God's message. Justice, not false piety. Mercy, not empty offerings. Righteousness, not loud singing. Let justice flow down like a river. Righteousness like a never failing stream. And in our gospel reading, Jesus picks up the same theme, essentially saying to his followers, if you're treated like the prophets, take heart because you're probably doing something right. Part of the problem that we have in the 21st century, in my mind, and I stress I am not an economist. I did study one year of it, but I won't tell you how that ended. Part of the problem we have in the 21st century is that the economy is too often treated as an end in itself, unable to be changed, rather than being seen as a human system, which should be serving us. As has been said, trust the market. It's always on the side of the rich. Everything seems to revolve around gross domestic product. It's a disaster if it doesn't grow. We would do well to remember the late Robert F. Kennedy's comment, gross domestic product measures everything. Everything that is, except that which makes life worthwhile. Because GDP doesn't measure our physical and mental well-being. It doesn't measure the quality of our education, living standards and social relationships. It doesn't measure the extent of unpaid and volunteer work in the community. And it doesn't measure the state of our natural resources. It doesn't measure the health or otherwise of our environment. It also doesn't measure the faults and fractures in our society. The firmly entrenched belief that continual economic growth as measured by GDP is the best and only way to measure and direct a nation's progress seems to me not only to be inadequate, but also increasingly destructive. It's clear that we need a new structure we, need, we seem to have forgotten the stem, ecos, home, hearth, community. We need a way of measuring that has a more human scale. Let justice flow down like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. A group of prominent Australians have proposed a new framework the Australian National Development Index. And I'd like to share with you a bit over two and a half minutes of their video. Thanks, Paul. We're measuring the wrong things and not measuring things that really count for our well-being for the world being on the planet. The real work of what a just society is, it doesn't really occur to us. We intuitively know, but we don't measure it. You know, whilst Australia is such an economically prosperous country, I think that we're really held back by our conservatism and this, you know, idea that we can't challenge the status quo. We can't think anew. But how exciting if just by changing the way we think and believe in things, we could change the world. 
As a society, and there are no surprises to this, we, we love measuring things in terms of dollars and cents. Uh, it's very attractive to have economic impact studies because, uh, you know, inevitably these things are relatively easier to measure than, uh, than, than feelings and sensations and, uh, uh, you know, indexes, uh, indices of relevance and fulfilment and what have you. So my worry, my concern about how our current progress is measured is that it is a singular measure of financial uh, economic success. The truth is that if you measure simply GNI growth, uh, as we do, uh, without asking the question about growing inequality, you can't explain growing imprisonment, violence, mental illness, um, people's sense of uh, often profound emptiness. We measure things in a way that totally discounts the environment. It's crazy. Think about this for one minute. The dreadful bushfires which claimed lives here, those dreadful bushfires would have actually made Australia's GDP, the thing we use to measure our economy, they would have made our GDP go up because GDP just measures throughput in the economy. I think that in our society there are those that are not doing as well as others and that really requires a different way at looking at these problems. Um, we have, you know, minority groups, we have indigenous communities that are not doing as well as other Australians and, you know, the answer isn't necessarily economic participation or e economic growth or enhancing the participation of these communities in the economy. It's actually improving social indicators. Thanks, Paul. An, an interesting idea. And as I said earlier, I'm not an economist. And I know that there are a number of other ideas. My point is to say that I think we need to start to look at the systems, especially our, our economic system, in a way that is more person-centred. I think it's a real positive that some of those ideas are beginning to gain far more mainstream traction. Because our heritage, our Judeo-Christian heritage and story offers a strong vision for an alternative economics based on values and principles such as compassion, as hospitality, as generosity, cooperation, relationships and, and community. Offers a structure based on respect for the natural world as God's good creation, for life as God's abundant gift, and for the need for societies to prioritize the needs of those who are poor, marginalized and oppressed. That's what our tradition says we need to aim for. Let justice flow down like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. And we've all got a part to play in bringing God's economy to life in this world. And as Christians and as churches, I think we've got a special responsibility to model a different way of living in the world. We're called to realise that just as it is in family life and among friends, so it is in the life of our wider community. If one person is disadvantaged or left behind, we are all diminished. We cannot survive without others and we can only grow and achieve our potential in relationship to others, both human and other living creatures. So how do we move forward? As I said earlier, in, in our 20, 21st century world, what is good news? The key, I believe, is to have a balanced view of hope. The former London chief, chief rabbi, and he's worth Googling, he has the most gorgeous voice, Jonathan Sachs, once said this about hope. 
one of the most important distinctions, sorry, I'll try again, one of the most important distinctions I have learned in the course of reflection on Jewish history is the difference between optimism and hope. Optimism is the belief that things will get better. Hope is the belief that together we can make things better. Optimism is a passive virtue. Hope is an active one. It takes no courage to be an optimist, but it takes a great deal of courage to have hope. The Hebrew Bible is not an optimistic book. It is, however, one of the great literatures of hope. And I think that that middle section is worth repeating. Hope is the belief that together we can make things better. It takes no courage to be an optimist, but it takes a great deal of courage to have hope. Let justice flow down like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. I want to suggest three things that we can all do, and I'll be brief. Three things that can help us to carry hope into the world. Firstly, educate. Educate ourselves and educate others. We all have access to a vast storehouse of learning, our friend, Dr. Google. And yes, we have to take care, we have to cross-reference, we have to cross-check, we have to share with other people and get their views, and we have to reference back to the Bible and to our lived experience but we can do it. And when we do it, we can then share it. Secondly, we can advocate. Advocate for change. We can use the power we have to sign petitions, to write letters, to send emails, to make comments and to join groups. It's easy for us to feel as we get older that we have lost our power. One of the joys of our connected society is that we still have power that we can use. And thirdly, I believe we can allocate our resources. The story of Adani and the refusal of Australia's four major banks to fund them because of public pressure is a lesson in what is possible. And I know that it's far more complex than just that simple statement. But we can have influence through our choice of banks, our choice of power companies, our choice of where we direct our superannuation, our choice of where we direct our buying power and our investment power. Through that, we can act to create hope. Whoops, my printer's printed me a blank page. I hope that's not a, no, it's all right. Let justice flow down like a river, righteousness like a, like a never failing stream. Finally, two pieces of writing before our listening song gives us time to reflect. The first is a poem by a Scottish minister called David Coleman, who is the Echo Chaplain at Echo Congregations Scotland, which is a loose coalition of Scottish churches passionate about environmental justice. And the second is a statement written by the Australian Uniting Churches, Reverend Ellie Poulos. The poem is titled, The People Talked. The people talked and the rain still fell. 
The people talked and the leaves still turned to gold. The people talked and the poor still starved. The people talked and the earth still lay raped. The resolutions reflected the people's mind, but where was the people's heart? And from Ellie Poulos, our challenge as God's people is to accompany people from the margins into a journey towards the fullness of, of life and love. We are meant to be in the coalface, in the messiness of it all, and at the same time, in fidelity to the gospel. Like Christ in his ministry among the sick and the lost, we are called to meet God in the most unlikely people and places. We too must be in that frontier space. Amen. Thanks, Paul. I don't know whether anyone wants to make a comment. Please don't ask me, ask me an economics question. It wasn't intended to be a reflection on economics, but more about priorities and, and directions. John. Yeah, um, 
uh, thank you for that uh, sermon, Simon. It was yeah, very very insightful. Um, the good news for us in the ACT is that the ACT government has actually adopted a wellbeing framework to guide policy making and the budget. Um, and and this wellbeing framework encompasses many domains apart from the economy, including domains of health and safety and environment and climate change, social connection, identity and belonging and education. And in the budget that will be coming out on October the 5th, you will actually see some of the budget measures are measured against the the new ACT wellbeing framework. So we this is this is world leading stuff that the ACT is doing. Great, thanks, John. Barbara, you will need to unmute yourself. Yes, um, just uh, just uh, I caught the. I'm really interested in the how, of course. Mm. Uh, so what was the third one? There was educate, advocate, and uh, I was allocate allocate our like our funds like yeah, our resources yeah. our resources okay yeah. all right great thank you can i add something please to the certainly margaret prayer list uh that phone call i had at 10 30 was from one of my school friends uh as most of you know in december i go to two lunches one of my PFA and church friends and on the Tuesday, then five of us who went to school together, who were very close. Uh, I'd like us to remember the Peggot family. Bev and I have been friends for nigh on 70 years mm -hmm. and she's just had an aneurysm oh. and it's when not if. And mm -hmm. so if we can remember them, because Anthony, her husband has uh, early dementia, so there's going to be a lot of changes in that household at this week as uh, he won't be able to care for himself without Beverly and this has been very sudden. So please remember Beverly and the Negat family. Thank you for sharing that with us, Margaret. I think that is probably an appropriate lead in. Kerry, would you like to lead us in prayer, please? Yes, I've just added that onto the list. Thank you, Margaret. Um, let's let us all now pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come together to pray for our world, its people, those we know and those we know of. Internationally, we are praying for the countries of Bolivia, Brazil, Chile and Peru beautiful South American countries with vast natural resources and vibrant cultures, but also countries riddled with injustice and corruption. We pray for wisdom for their teachers. We pray for their churches that are fighting against corruption and injustice while trying to protect the people and the land and the natural environment. Today, we also pray for the peoples of Germany and Europe as Angela Merkel leaves the stage and whatever will happen next. In Australia, we pray for those dealing with COVID. Today, we particularly pray for those in the Calvary Hayden retirement community and those in the Canberra hospital. May those who are sick be healed and those who are anxious to get anxious to get all the help and knowledge they need to ease their fears we pray for those who are finding it harder to live in isolation as this lockdown drags on we pray for the borders to be opened for the reuniting of families and the hope that with vaccinations life will resume soon Lord, give all of us strength to carry on daily until we can all be together with those we love. In our parish, we pray for those of our congregation who are unwell, 
either physically or mentally. We pray for our families and friends. We pray for Robin Swaddling Rope. We pray for Margaret Erickson and her friend Beverly and her family. We pray for those who can't access Zoom, which adds to the feeling of isolation. Lord, we are so grateful that we can come to you with our concerns, our fears, and that you do hear us and your Holy Spirit rests upon us all. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kerry. Our last hymn is from one of the great modern hymn writers, Colin, Colin Gibson, and it's called, ironically enough, Let Justice Roll Down Like a River. Let justice roll down like a river Let justice flow down to the sea Let justice roll down like a river Let justice begin through me Justice for all who go hungry Crying to God to be fair Before we have our final blessing, please look after yourselves. Um, thank you to Barbara for a lovely PowerPoint presentation. Thank you always to Paul for his great Zoom maestring. Thank you to John and Kerry and Pam and everybody for being here. It's been fantastic to see you. And remember that after five minutes or so after our blessing song, there will be breakout rooms for you to have a chat in smaller groups. So friends, as we leave this virtual sacred space, 
Let us embrace the work and wonder of the day with fresh commitment. May we go forward together in the power of the love of God, in the company of Jesus Christ, and being led by the Holy Spirit. Amen. I always think about things that are consistent. 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 I always